Hello, we're in Exodus 1. We're going to look at the 70 souls. All the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob. So just to read the first five verses. Now these are the names of the children of Israel, which came into Egypt. Every man and his household came with Jacob, Reuben, Simeon, Levi and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun and Benjamin, Dan and Nephtali, Gad and Asher, and all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were seventy souls, for Joseph was in Egypt already. Okay. Welcome back. I think this is going to be of great interest. I didn't intend to dedicate a whole video to this. I was going to go straight into Amram and the midwives and their generation, the generation before Moses, Aaron and Miriam. But I think it's important to look at these 70 souls because God has thrown out a few numbers at us. We've got the 70 mentioned here. They're the seed of Jacob. So if we include Jacob, there's 71. Genesis 46, which we'll be looking at in quite some detail, tells us that 66 came down from Canaan into Egypt and that there were 70 in total, meaning four were in Egypt, or four were in Egypt that didn't come down from Canaan. And then Acts chapter seven talks about 75 that Joseph called of his brethren, of his kindred. And when God does math, it's not quite how we tend to do maths. God's maths are quite different and quite intriguing. And the only way to really get a grip of God's numbers are to look at his numbers through the lenses of various different people. It's a little bit like looking at the gospel accounts, understanding there are four different authors. They all have a different, slightly different perspective, viewpoint. Also, you've got the people written about in those gospels. So we see things from Jesus' perspective, also from Peter's perspective, from the perspectives of various other people, John the Baptist, Pontius Pilate and others. And to understand who the 70 souls are, we need to look at the narrative or narratives through the lenses of Jacob, also through the eyes of Joseph and several other people, Leah, Levi and others. And if we do that, the numbers which seem to be somewhat contradictory, the numbers suddenly start coming together and telling a story. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to go straight over to Genesis chapter 46 and go through much of that chapter there, which is a fairly detailed genealogy of the children, grandchildren and even great grandchildren of Jacob. But just before we do that, one thing to bring into context, a little information to bring forward, which you'll see as we go through the scriptures, is that the wives of the sons of Jacob are not counted in the 70. These are purely those that came 
out of the loins of Jacob. It's important to understand that. So the wives of his sons are not included in the 70, though obviously they came down into Egypt also. And the four mothers of Jacob's children, Rachel, Leah, Bilhah and Zilpah, those four are not the seed of Jacob out of the loins of Jacob. Um, so we'll be looking at those four women in particular as well in this fairly comprehensive study. Okay. So to begin with, we'll look at the named sons and grandsons or sons and grandchildren, I should say. There are females included. And verse eight starts with the six sons that were the sons of Jacob and Leah. And these are the names of the children of Israel, which came into Egypt And this expression came into Egypt is going to have some significance a little later on. Jacob and his sons, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and the sons of Reuben, Hanoch and Falu and Hezron and Kami. So we've got four sons of Reuben and the sons of Simeon Jemuel and Jamin and Ohad and Jakin and Zohar and Shaul or Shaul the son of a Canaanitish woman so the sons of Simeon six one two three four five, six. And the sons of Levi, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari, three, one, two, three. And the sons of Judah, Ur, and Onan, and Shelah, and Phares, and Zerah. But Ur and Onan died in the land of Canaan. Okay, so the sons of Judah, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, but 2 of the 5 are not included in the 66 that travelled from Canaan into Egypt and now we've got two more mentioned who are the sons of Phares and the sons of Phares were Hezron and Hamul so we've got two added got two taken away from those that came into Egypt and two added, which are the great grandsons of Jacob. Okay, so look at the generations. Son of Jacob, grandsons of Jacob, and great grandsons of Jacob. And the sons of Issachar. Tola and Puvar and Job and Shimron. Four. One, two, three, four. And the sons of Zebulun, Sered and Elon and Jalil. Three. One, two, three. 
These be the sons of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob in Padanaram, with his daughter Dina, all the souls of his sons and his daughters were thirty and three. Okay. So Dina is Jacob's daughter, she's included in the seventy. And all the souls of his his sons, Jacob's sons and his daughters were thirty and three. Now the thing of note here is bearing in mind that Leah is not seed of the loins of Jacob, she's his first wife. There's not thirty and three sons, daughters, grandsons, great grandsons. So let's just examine this little section of scripture a little bit more. Bear the numbers broken down. So sons of Jacob through Leah's line, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun and Dina, seven. The numbers of grandchildren are as such, four, six, three, five, four, three, there, totaling 25. There's the two sons of Judah, Ur and Onan, who died in Canaan. They didn't go into Egypt. They're not included in the numbers. Okay, so minus two. And then the two grandsons of Judah or great grandsons of Leah and Jacob are two mentioned in the passage of scripture. So seven plus the 25, 32, minus the two, Ur and Onan, gives us 30, and then plus the two grandsons, 32. But the scripture tells us that all the souls of his sons and his daughters through the line of Leah were 33. But we've only got 32 named, meaning that there's one unnamed soul in the passage of Scripture. And that's the conclusion a, a Bible believer would come to. Of course, skeptics and scoffers and mockers will say there's contradictions in the Scripture. Well, we don't believe that. We believe in doing due diligence study and research so we're going to believe that there's one unnamed soul among the descendants from Leah and Jacob's line now what's interesting to note here is the expression all the souls of his sons that she, Leah, bear unto Jacob in Padan Aram, all the souls of his sons and his daughters were thirty and three, but we've only got one daughter named. Let's just go back up. So we started in verse eight. Look at the previous two verses, which tell us something. Verse six, and they took their cattle and their goods, which they had gotten in the land of Canaan, and came into Egypt, Jacob and all his seed with him, his sons and his sons' sons with him, his daughters 
and his sons, daughters, and all his seed brought he with him into Egypt. All his seed. Okay, let's go down. Where did we finish off here? There's the 33 there. So now we'll look at the sons through the line of Zilpah. This is Leah's maidservant. So from verse 16. And the sons of Gad, Ziphion, and Hagi, Shuni, and Esbon, Eri, and Arodi, Arodi and Areli. And I apologise if I'm butchering any of these names. So, sons of Gad, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And the sons of Asher, Jimna and Ishua, and Isu, or Isui, and Beriah, and Sarah, their sister. Okay, we've got a female mentioned here. And then we've got grandchildren or, or great grandchildren to Zilpah. So the sons of Asher, one, two, three, four, and one daughter, Sarah, five children of Asher, and the sons of Beriah. So these are sons that are already born. Jacob's great grandchildren, Heber and Malkiel, too. These are the sons of Zilpah, who Laban gave to Leah, his daughter, and these she bare unto Jacob, even sixteen souls. And this is helping us define what we read in the previous passage about Leah, is that Leah is not counted as one of the souls, okay, because Zilpah is not counted here. We've got sons of Gad, seven, sons of Asher, five. So that's twelve plus Gad and Asher, which we need to count, 14, and the two great, great, uh, sorry, the two great grandchildren, Heber and Malkiel, another two, 16. So when you count Gad and Asher, their sons, which are another 12, and the two grandchildren of Asher, A total of 16 so we know that Zilpah is not counted as one of these 16 souls just like Leah isn't counted as one of the 33 souls okay so 33 souls from the line of Leah and 16 from the line of Zilpah then we look at the sons of Rachel The sons of Rachel, Jacob's wife, Joseph and Benjamin. And unto Joseph in the land of Egypt were born Manasseh and Ephraim, which Asenath, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of On, bare unto him. Okay, so. Joseph and Benjamin, two sons of Rachel. Joseph had two sons which were born in the land of Egypt, 
Manasseh and Ephraim and the sons of Benjamin were Bela and Becher and Ashbel, Gera, Naaman, Ehi and Rosh, Mupim and Hupim and Ard. These are ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. These are the sons of Rachel, which were born to Jacob. All the souls were fourteen. Okay. Joseph and Benjamin, two. Joseph's two sons, that's four. And Benjamin's ten sons, that's fourteen. Fourteen, as the scripture says. So, the souls from the line of Rachel were 14 and now we've just got of the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Dan Hushim one and the sons of Naphtali and Jaziel and Guni and Jezer and Shilem Four, one, two, three, four. These are the sons of Bilhar, which Laban gave unto Rachel his daughter. So Bilhar is Rachel's handmaid. And she bared these unto Jacob. All the souls were seven. So Dan and Naphtali. Dan had one son and Naphtali had four, totaling seven. Through Leah's line, 33 souls. Through Zilpah's line, 16. Through Rachel's line, 14. And through Bilhah's line, seven, totaling 70. Okay, so the 70 souls, which we'll look at in a minute in more detail, that adds up perfectly fine. The 33 from Leah's line doesn't add up unless you add one unnamed, unless you believe there's one in there that's unnamed, not a named person in the scripture. It's 32 named plus one unnamed. But so far this is pretty simple and I'm going to try and keep this as simple as possible which is why I'm going through it a little bit slowly and in as much detail as possible so there's the seven from Bilhar's line now the next two verses are incredibly important verses 26 and 27 all the souls that came with Jacob into Egypt, which came out of his loins beside Jacob's son's wives, meaning alongside or with. So they're together, but they're not included in the numbers, okay? Jacob's son's wives, besides Jacob's son's wives, all the souls were three score and six. Three score, that's three times 20, which is 60 and six, 66. Okay. All the souls that came with Jacob into Egypt, 66. And the sons of Joseph, which were born him in Egypt, were two souls. So we know that's Manasseh and Ephraim, his two sons. All the souls of the house of Jacob. Now we're going back. Look, don't get confused. 
the sons of Joseph. Now we're talking about the house of Jacob. So you've got to keep viewing. God is forcing us to keep switching back and forth in understanding these numbers, okay? All the souls of the house of Jacob which came into Egypt were three score and ten. That's sixty plus ten, seventy. And this is where things get a little bit important because it says all the souls of the house of Jacob which came into Egypt were three score and ten. Now does that the 70 does that include Jacob or not when scripture says the house of Jacob is Jacob included in this number no it isn't no he isn't I should say all the souls back in Exodus 1 all the souls that came out of the loins loins of Jacob came out of the loins of Jacob was 70 souls okay all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls all the souls of the house the family of Jacob it's not saying all the souls out of the loins well it is saying that all the souls out of the house of Jacob meaning the loins of Jacob which came into Egypt were three score and ten seventy souls so Jacob you have to add Jacob to this number to make 71 okay got 71 that came including Jacob And all the souls that came with Jacob into Egypt, which came out of his loins, besides Jacob's son's wives, all the souls were three score and six. And if we get these numbers right, we'll understand the 75 that we're going to look at shortly in. Acts chapter 7 okay so far this is pretty straightforward but here's where we need to add a little bit of discernment okay so 66 Canaan. 66 came out of Canaan seventy in total talking about the seed so Joseph and his two sons Manasseh and Ephraim they are the seed of the loins of Jacob okay but there's only three and it might it would be easy to think ah the 66 are the seed add Jacob into that number you got 67 70 in total which would leave three in Egypt being Joseph and his two sons Manasseh and Ephraim it would be very easy to come to that conclusion maybe that's the right conclusion but I don't think so I'll tell you why there's another unnamed person in the genealogies okay because if we're going to include Jacob then we've got to come to a figure of 71 not 70 so the four here are Joseph his two sons Manasseh 
plus one unnamed. I'm going to show you that this is in fact the correct. I'm going to show you that this is the correct conclusion we should be coming to because there's another unnamed person in the Genesis 46 genealogy and you're going to say well how can that be because we've got the 70 which includes 69 named and one unnamed how can there be two unnamed i'll show you how this can be okay so let's go back up to verses six and seven okay jacob and all his seed with him okay his sons his sons sons with him his daughters plural and his sons daughters plural well first of all we've only got one daughter named which is Dina and second thing we've only got one of his sons and daughters named which is Sarah the sons of Asher four sons and Sarah their sister that's the only granddaughter of Jacob named in this whole genealogy only one female so there we know it's plural there is another There is another okay so i'm going to show you how this works now okay so if we take this at face value scripture talks about his jacob's daughters and his son's daughters which is a clear distinction there. So why should we take this literally? Because scripture literally says, Jacob and all his seed, his seed with him, his sons and his sons, sons with him, his daughters and his sons, daughters, and all his seed brought he with him into Egypt. I mean, it's pretty, be pretty difficult not to take this literally and at face value it doesn't seem like complicated scripture also verse 15 these be the sons of Leah so they're all sons which you bear unto Jacob oh no and Dina sorry they're not all sons these be the sons of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob in Padanaram. <laughs> I always have to stop and double check what I'm saying with that word. Padanaram. And with his daughter, so there we are, his daughter, Dina, so she's literally Jacob's daughter. All the souls of his sons and his daughters were thirty and three okay whose sons and daughters Jacob's now that's quite interesting I think we're going to find this very interesting actually look these be the sons of Leah which she bare unto Jacob in Padanaram with his daughter Dina You notice how this scripture is separating Dina from the possibility of another daughter which should be in this 33. Sons and daughters were 30 and 3. Isn't that interesting? And you'll, you'll find out why that is. 
very shortly we're going to go there and, and uncover what's going on. But it's pretty clear there's two scriptures here that talk about Jacob's daughters, plural, not meaning Dina and any other female grandchildren because that's clearly differentiated in verse 7, his daughters, his son's daughters, etc. So what on earth is going on? We've got daughters and his son's daughters, both plural, but we've only got one of each in the Genesis 46 narrative. We've only got one daughter, Dina, and one granddaughter, Sarah, in the narrative. So we've got two missing females. Okay, now you're going to have to bear with me to see how God does this mathematically and how it's not easy. Um, we've got two missing females, but we know there's only 70, that's not including Jacob, there's 70 of his seed, but we've only got one missing in the numbers. Do you see the conundrum? Of the, 60, the 66 that came out of Canaan, one's missing here in Leah's line. And there's supposed to be four in Egypt, Joseph and his two sons, and someone we don't know about. So we've got two unnamed, a daughter and a granddaughter, but only one missing person fills in and completes the 70. Isn't that fascinating? Now, I understand, I do understand this, that there, there are going to be people and probably a majority of people that will say, no, Jacob only had 12 sons and one daughter, 13. Okay. But then you've got to account for this. If you can put the missing 33rd person in here, without Jacob having more than 13 sons and one daughter, then go ahead, go ahead. But I think you might want to hear me out okay so there's a female in the missing numbers here in Leah's narrative there's one unnamed there's one female there's one missing female that is hidden so well that nobody can see her. She has no name. She has no narrative. There's no backstory. There's no events. There's no mention of her. Nobody in scripture talks about her other than what we know in Genesis 46 and a couple of short verses. There's nothing at all in the scripture that gives us any clue how can that be a child a daughter of Jacob that we don't know about well I'm going to make a suggestion you can take it or leave it it's just the suggestion but the answer is in everything I've just said she was hidden she had no name she has no narrative there's no events surrounding her at all she was in the womb 
when the children of Israel came over or came down from Canaan down into Egypt she was in the womb and died shortly after in Egypt so she made the journey she was a miscarried or stillborn child probably miscarried I would imagine because she's never named she's never given a name she never had a name she's not given a biblical narrative because she never had a biblical narrative we don't see the events because there were no events and think of it this way miscarriage stillbirth children dying in the womb is a reality it's it's part of our reality it's part of our world it's what goes on it's probably more common than we think i don't know it's not something i've looked into but we know what i mean we know that there are stillbirths miscarriages these things are not that uncommon it's a reality of the world we live in and if it's a reality in the world we live in it has to be in scripture anything that affects human experience is in scripture I'm not saying everything is in scripture because there are things that God will reveal in his time spiritual things maybe things in heaven maybe things God doesn't want revealed to man at this moment but anything anything at all that affects our human lived experience our human reality is in scripture it has to be otherwise we don't have the full counsel of God we need to know we need to be able to see things like this in scripture so that we know we have the word of God and it would be pretty important for this generation in particular the sons of Jacob and the grandchildren of Jacob it would be pretty important for them to have a grasp or have an experience of this kind of reality because they are going into a land where death reigns where there's a culture of unbelief and death now for the next conundrum did Leah ever go down into Egypt because I don't think she did in which case how could she have carried a child in the womb from Canaan to Egypt she couldn't so in Genesis 49 because we don't have any narrative on the death of Leah as it happened um, although we do on Rachel but not on Leah so Jacob is on his deathbed now so first of all about Jacob he entered Egypt when he was 130 years old he dies at 147 so he's been in Egypt 17 years he lived in Egypt before he eventually died he says this he's talking to well he's talking to his children okay he says in the cave that is in the field of 
Machpelah, which is before Mamre in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron the Hittite for a possession of a burying place. And by the way, pay attention in the Old Testament in Genesis to how much land was bought by Abraham, Isaac and Jacob in the promised land. It's very interesting. Um, there they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife. So this is in, where? In the land of Canaan, near Mamre. There they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah, his wife. And there I buried Leah. And there I buried Leah. Now, this tells us that Leah never came to Egypt because Jacob, why is Jacob telling his sons? I'll tell you why. This is for Joseph's benefit. So he's gathered his sons together to give various kinds of blessings. Although I wouldn't call what he said to Levi a blessing. Um, Joseph is a fruitful bough. Even a fruitful bough by a well whose branches run over the wall. The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. But his bow abode in strength and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd of the stone of Israel. Okay. Um, and it even goes on beyond that. But this is for Joseph's benefit. Joseph wasn't there when Leah was buried. Had Leah come down into Egypt then Joseph would have known obviously and had she died in Egypt and Jacob had taken her up back up to Mamre to bury her Joseph would have known of course all the brothers would have known all the children would have known so as Jacob is dying you see here in the last verse he yielded up the ghost and was gathered unto his people okay while Jacob was giving his last words he reveals to Joseph where he buried Leah just in case the brothers forgot to tell him I guess so So we've got a narrative that still doesn't fit until you consider Silpa, the hand servant of Leah. Let's go into Genesis 30. So of course, here we have Rachel, when she saw that she bare Jacob no children, what did she do? Behold my maid Bilhah, go in unto her, and she shall bear upon my knees, that I may also have children by her. See, that I may also have children by her. Rachel is using her maid, Bilha to carry Jacob's children for her. Now of course later Rachel did have two of her own children which were Joseph and Benjamin. Um, and in exactly the same way because Leah had, remember Leah had six sons and a daughter. 
When Leia saw that she had left bearing, she took Zilpah, her maid, and gave her Jacob to wife. Okay, so then Zilpah um, bears Jacob, uh, who Gad and Asher, wasn't it? I think Gad and Asher. Yes, Gad and Asher. So, I mean, this goes back, doesn't it, to Abraham and Sarah. Sarah didn't believe she was going to conceive. So she gave her handmaid, Hagar, to Abraham for Hagar to carry a child for her. Of course, she shouldn't have done that because, not because there was anything particularly wrong with it, but um, because God had t promised Sarah a child. So we see this is something that's continued down through several generations, this, um, this practice of surrogacy. So Rachel died, Leah died, they both died in Canaan. They didn't go down to Egypt. But what about Bilhar and Zilpah? How do we know whether they went down to Egypt? Well, we got some scripture on Bilhar. It's only a bit vague, I'm afraid, but it's all we got. Let's go to First Chronicles chapter 4. In First Chronicles chapter 4, we got some genealogical line of Simeon. We're not too interested in the sons of Simeon right now. Um, but there's important information in the genealogies. Don't ignore them. So through the generations, and then it tells us where all these various sons and grandsons and descendants of Simeon dwelt. And it gives us a list of a number of names of towns and cities. And they dwelt at Beersheba and Malada and Hazar, Shual and at Bilhar and so on and so forth. There's a number of towns and cities named there. Now there's a name, there's a town or a city named Bilhar in the promised land which was formerly the land of Canaan and that's the only mention of this name we have outside of Bilhar's actual narrative, Bilhar the maid of Rachel. So it would seem this town is named after Bilhar and why not? She's the mother of a number of Jacob's children. Um, there's nothing unusual about this at all. Uh, is so it's most likely the place she died because there's a common pattern in scripture where there's an event or a person that, or an event and scripture will say and the name of that place was such and such until this day or you know regarding regarding various biblical events or even the deaths of people it's a, quite a common thing that these in these earlier narratives um, especially going into the promised land they renamed everything or they named places anew or afresh or for the first time um, as they were building as the tribes were growing and building their thing in the promised land so there's nothing there would be nothing unusual about this being uh, named after Bilhar Rachel's servant being 
um, the mother of several of Jacob's children. There'd be nothing unusual about honoring her in this way, naming a town or a city after her. Um, but most likely it was the place she died. That's, they didn't just randomly call uh, t towns and cities after people. It's usually connected to where that person lived or an event in their life that happened there. So I would say that Bilhah died in Canaan, that she didn't go down to Egypt. So Rachel, Leah and Bilhah all died in Canaan, in the land of Canaan, as far as we can see. I mean, you can debate Bilhah or not, that's, that's fine. But Bilhah was not Leah's handmaid anyway, she was Rachel's handmaid. It wouldn't have been on her to carry Leah's future children. Um, Zilpah, we have absolutely nothing on Zilpah that I can find regarding how long she lived, where, where she lived, where she was buried, where she died, I mean, not where she lived, where she died, uh, where she was buried or anything like that at all. So I would say that if Leah had another daughter, she did it by proxy through, a, through, a surrogate, through the surrogacy of Zilpah, just like she did previously when Zilpah carried Gad and Asher for, see these, these, these two handmaids or hand servants, maid servants, they weren't the wives of Jacob, they were carrying for the wives of Jacob. So that makes sense then if Zilpah was the one who survived old age until, because they were all, all getting on in age somewhat. It would seem that Zilpah did go down into Egypt carrying the unnamed 33rd child. That's the only way I think we can make sense of that narrative. But who's the one unnamed in Egypt who's counted as the 70 but can't be of the 70 because we've now completed the 70? That is Levi's daughter. Because Levi had a daughter. His daughter, she's never mentioned in the main genealogies, in the long genealogies at all, as far as I know. I could be wrong on that. But she is named in several other places of scripture. So Exodus 2, 1, and there went a man of the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi. Now this is a literal, a literal daughter of Levi. Okay, so we remember Genesis 46, Levi has three sons, no mention of a daughter in Genesis 46. So this would be a, grand, a granddaughter of Jacob, which makes sense then. His son's daughters, plural, makes perfect sense. So he did have granddaughters, plural. Um, okay, so remember, Levi, a son of Jacob. These are the names of the sons of Levi according to their generations. Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. And the years of the life of Levi were 137 years. So the line down from Levi to Moses is Levi, Kohath, Amran. Amran is Levi's grandson, the great grandson of um, Jacob. And then Aaron, Moses and Miriam, of course, as well, are the sons and daughters of the children of Amram. So 
But here we are. Verse 20. And Amram took him, Josebed, his father's sister, to wife. Who's his father? Kohath. Kohath has a sister. So these are the names of the sons of Levi according to their generations. Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. Kohath has a sister. Now, is the sister the offspring of Levi or Kohath's mother by another man? That's the question. We'll go to Numbers 26. Numbers 26, verse 59. And the name of Amran's wife was Josebed. I'm probably butchering her name, by the way. Josebed, Josebed, Josebed. I don't know how to pronounce her name exactly. Never mind. Josebed, the daughter of Levi, whom her mother bare to Levi in Egypt, in Egypt, okay, and she bare Amran, Aaron, Moses and Miriam, their sister, okay, so 100% certain that Josebed is Levi's daughter and Amran's wife. Here's the thing. If she's Amram's wife, remember Amram is Levi's grandson. If she's Amram's wife, giving birth to Aaron, Moses and Miriam. Now remember, Moses and the Exodus or the exodus happened when Moses was 80 years old okay Moses was 80 when he led the people out of Egypt so Levi gave birth or he didn't give birth his mother her mother I'm getting mixed up So Levi had a daughter, Josebed, decades, it had to be decades after, it had to be decades after the children of Israel came into Egypt because they were in Egypt approximately 200 years and a bit more 210 220 around that number i think there's some scholars would i wouldn't trust the scholars too much but biblical scholars who only read the king james bible many would come to the conclusion it's about 215 years and they look at the the ages of people in the genealogies etc so it is about that 215 220 or 210 years somewhere in that region so for her to be giving birth to three children around this time 80 years before the exodus um, no she's not 120 years old or 130 or even 140 years old at this time she was born a number of decades into the sojourning in Egypt okay so let's see if that makes any sense the four in Egypt the four in Egypt I am gonna put Josibet's name in there now
why would it be just bed because obviously more granddaughters and great granddaughters to Jacob are born in Egypt that's fairly obvious so why would it be Jossie bed over another descendant of Jacob well first of all she is Levi's daughter so she's actually Jacob's granddaughter I don't think he had any other granddaughters after her great granddaughters sure many but granddaughters which is what we were looking at isn't it the sons his son's sons his daughters his son's daughters so she absolutely fits into the categories of those that came out of the land of Canaan into Egypt but she wasn't ever in the land of Canaan just like the two sons of Joseph now Joseph's counted among these four because at the time of the traveling down into Egypt by the tribe of Jacob Joseph was already in Egypt he didn't travel with them his two sons are born in Egypt and Josebed is born in Egypt even though it's decades later so there is something quite unusual about Josebed being there in this this number of course because she doesn't she's right at the end of the generation she's right at the end of this she's she's the outer edges of the generation of the children of Israel if you like and also how does she fit into this number she doesn't fit into this number unless unless she's been put in to complete the number not to replace now I want to be clear about what I'm saying here she's not replacing the unnamed daughter of Leah or Zilpah in that sense the the, the young soul the young soul who traveled to Egypt but was never born alive she's not it's not it's not a direct replacement is first of all it's happening several numerous actually I would think decades later but it is to complete this number and there's a reason for that you see Levi needed redemption not salvation redemption redemption for what remember Levi and Simeon and I think this is the blame seems to go in scripture mainly on Levi a bit on Simeon as well he suffered consequences but the scripture puts all the yeah, the focus or the emphasis on this being something that Levi did particularly and Simeon followed him into it um, that they slaughtered all the men of Shechem if you remember to defend who's on who's on her Dina's to defend Dina's honor okay and the Lord was not well pleased with this um, now to you or I you know we, we, we can have a, a great deal of sympathy and empathy I have personally a great deal of empathy for Levi and Simeon um, they defended their sister's honor they did it they did it probably not in the, in the best of ways and circumstances when the tribe of Jacob was so young and weak at that point Jacob 
himself was mightily angry because they had to get up and go then because the the people of other cities around them would have come and slaughtered them because they just killed a whole load of Canaanites in the city um, so Jacob was angry with Levi and Simeon God wasn't too pleased either but there's always this is continual theme of there being a redemption for believers in the scriptures um, and it would be strange not to see redemption for Levi um, it, it's pretty important that there was actually so he defends the honor of his sister at the end it would have been right near the end of his life he would have had this redemption of being blessed with a daughter he defends the honor of his sister his other sister the unnamed one is lost in uh, in pregnancy in the, in the in the womb then God blesses Levi with a daughter who what does she do she bears Amram Aaron and Moses and Miriam this is a big blessing by the way okay and she is the fourth one here that makes up completes again the number 70 it, because it was never really completed it was the, there were 70 souls but one was not born alive so the set the number 70 was never really completed although the unnamed one is counted in that number okay so it's I, I wouldn't say Josibed replaces the uh, the the unnamed daughter I would say she succeeds her in that way to 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 as an act of completion as an act of redemption for Levi being blessed with a daughter that's an act of redemption for Levi and it's an act of completion as well it's, it's more symbolic than anything else I think but um, yeah and it's unusual because what you're getting is you're getting a man being redeemed through childbirth also which is awesome because uh, you see redemption for women coming through childbearing all through the Old Testament and often you see redemption for the Levites as well because the Levites were for the main part the remnant of believers when the apostasy started happening um, of course you see redemption for Aaron after he made the golden calf he cast the golden calf for the people um, there had to be redemption for Aaron before he could receive the priesthood um, and there was the Levites were tested if this is all in Exodus 32 the Levites were tested Moses commanded that they go in and slay their apostate brothers and they did and they killed the Levites killed 3,000 that day that was a test before they received the priesthood and it was the priesthood that defended King David King Josiah and many others they were absolute elite warrior class priests in their time and, and their time would come later they would really shine and flourish in the Old Testament scriptures um, from the time of David onwards but uh, yeah there's redemption all the way through even Elizabeth in the New Testament let's go there quickly so in Luke chapter 1 we see a blessing 
which is also a redemption. Um, so Elizabeth, so Zacharias and Elizabeth are both descendants of Aaron, which makes them descendants of Amram and Kohath and Levi. Uh, so Elizabeth, his wife, was of the daughters of Aaron and her name was Elizabeth. Okay, um, so she's barren. They had no child because Elizabeth was barren and they were both and they both were now well stricken in years so they're blessed with a child who is John the Baptist Elizabeth shall bear thee a son and thou shalt call his name John I want you to look at what Elizabeth says uh, to God I can find it okay so she says and after those days his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months saying thus have the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take away so to take away my reproach among men now we are obviously understand this she was looked she was being looked down upon because she wasn't fertile having children so the Lord is blessing her and taking away her reproach among he's giving her something that she desired something that she she struggled with being you know being the object of maybe some mockery or would not mock I don't think it'd be open mockery it would just be kind of disdain quiet disdain or something like that and look this is where you get the expression that we all know and love the scripture we all know and love for with God nothing should be impossible in relation to this and behold thy cousin Elizabeth when she also conceived a son in her old age and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren for with God nothing should be impossible okay so I'd say that's the two unnamed now I did say we'd look quickly at Acts chapter 7 yeah we need to look at that just to just to have a complete picture of what's going on okay so Acts 7 verse 14 then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him and all his kindred three score and fifteen souls so three score and fifteen souls hmm. so this is Joseph calling he called his father Jacob to him so his father Jacob we know there are seventy in total he called his father Jacob to him no there are 70 plus Jacob and all his kindred all his kindred now who are all his kindred so let's put Jacob to one side for a moment outside of the 70 okay he's He's the 71 number well he's number one isn't he in the in the order of this really but um putting jacob to one side there's 70 kindred that are the seed of jacob now there must be five others there must be five others okay um and there are well, first of all, we've got to remove Jake, uh, Joseph from the 70 because he's counted as one of the 70. He's not calling himself. So this, if you put Jacob to one side and Joseph is not being the one, one being called, we've got 69 
but he calls for 75 that's a difference of six well I think Joseph knows that Rachel died because she died in childbirth to Benjamin so Rachel died before Joseph was sold into slavery in Egypt but he wouldn't know about or necessarily know about the deaths of Leah, Bilal and Silpah who he would know as his brethren I mean he would he was grown up with all these women okay um, they would be considered his brethren even though they're not physical seed of Jacob we're not talking about seed of Jacob alone here now we're talking about who Joseph was consider his kindred so those three those three he would have called his kindred well would he have also called his two sons to because they're all going to meet up together like a big party I would say all his kindred would include his own two sons who were already born at this point they may probably still been quite youngish children that gives us five we're looking for one more does he know that Zilpah's pregnant we don't know if it's Zilpah anyway it probably is um, yeah he probably knows about that too but that child would be part of the 70 anyway so we're looking for one more would he consider his wife to be kindred yes he would a man shall cleave to his wife and they shall be one flesh his wife would be the other that makes up the 75 so we've got the three women oh Zilpah hasn't died we've got so Rachel's died he's not calling her Leah and Bilhah probably most likely died in Canaan those two he may be calling if he hadn't heard of their deaths at this point he probably hadn't and Zilpah who's more than likely still alive okay if I just said she died I apologize I'm getting confused because <laughs> this, this is a uh, wow so the three women and the three of the four parents mothers that are that he doesn't know about uh, he knows Rachel's died so he's not calling her he's calling the other three his two sons and his wife that's the 75 his two sons and his wife he would definitely be calling as his kindred to the gathering he, he wants to make everyone known unto Pharaoh so of course when he's introducing his whole family of course his wife and his sons are going to be there so he's calling everyone together I think that's how we should see the 75 I could be wrong on this of course I could be wrong on all of this quite frankly <laughs> but um, I think we've kind of got the pieces put in place if we're right about this, the daughters of Jacob so I'm going to leave it there. We'll finish that there in the next video. I know I keep saying this. I keep meaning to make this video about Amram, but this I keep coming into coming across the things that are, are kind of peripheral to the narrative and trying to make sense of them. Like the 430 years in the last video, Jacob's 70 here. It takes a bit of time. So I do apologize that, you know, I'm a bit slow <laughs> a bit slow with certain things um, but we will get around to it when I've got the energy and it's probably going to be a really short video now it was going to be a big video you know this big video about Amran which is going to talk about all these other things but I realized all the things surrounding it are big issues big narratives 
but now we've uh, stripped all those away we're gonna see what we got left well so it'll be a short video <laughs> a short video about Amran and the midwives most likely now uh, or a shorter video to finish this whole series and playlist then okay so saying that until the next time take care much love and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all Amen.